Welcome to episode 7. I have no hat today, as you can see. I'm looking fresh. I got a haircut. People ask me how I manage to look so good, and I'll tell you the secret. I go to a barber, a uh, very famous barber. That's where this starts. The barber's name is Great Clips. And as a frequent customer, I get a special deal, $15 a haircut. So that's that's step one. Step two, and here's really the important part because I wanna make sure that this is emulatable in other countries where people are tuning into culpable. When I sit down in the chair at my barber, they say, what can I do you for? And I say, Alicia, I want my hair to be long enough that I don't look like I'm in the military, but short enough I look like I kill people. And she says, I reckon I can do that. And this is the result. And this has been the result for years when I choose to go to that famous barber. In between periods, I wear an array of hats, which you have been blessed to see over the last six episodes. Anyway, a few days ago, I went to a butcher shop to get my fill of meat because I hate the planet and I think we need to kill cows. It's sort of a combo. And at the butcher shop next door is a parking lot <clears throat> that sells porches and storage sheds, right? So these are those little things that look like houses. They have, a, they have a windows and what looks like a fake chimney and uh, they're painted and they have nice siding, vertical, horizontal, whatever you want. Storage sheds and they're pre-built and they'll put them on your property and you can put your lawnmower or dead cousin inside of them. And I stared at this parking lot for a couple seconds and today's episode was born. Just like that. Here's the story. When I was in college, I got into minimalism. And there's a long story why I got into minimalism. It's a good, not a good story, but there's good reasons for it. I was barfing, super sick, laying on my couch sideways, staring at all of my junk around the place, around the apartment I lived in with friends. And I just hated seeing it. It was stressing me out. So when I became well again, I started giving away and throwing away and selling and putting on Craigslist and eBay all of my stuff and lots of good stuff, guitar effects pedals, DVDs, like all kinds of stuff that's useful. I just got rid of it. And somewhere along the lines of getting into minimalism and reading books and uh, watching documentaries and, you know, reading these manifestos about the benefits of having less, less is more. I also went down another rabbit hole that is very tangential to minimalism, and that is the tiny house movement. I became super interested in one day having my own tiny house, which is not just a house that's tiny. Usually they are put on trailers, so therefore they are movable. You could install them directly onto a patch of land, but you could also carry them behind even a small sedan. You don't even need a truck. And they are usually 80 to 95 square feet of a bed and a window and a little kitchenette. Sometimes the bed is in a loft, so you have a little more space, a toilet, everything, right? So somewhere along the lines, I got into minimalism and then minimalism led me into the tiny house movement because they think they go really well together. They are a pairing, if you will. And I was finishing up college around this time and thinking about how much money I was making as a freelancer at that point. I didn't have a full-time job yet, and that's okay. And I was thinking, how can I maybe get myself one of these tiny homes so that I can stop living in an apartment and start building equity and all these things that our parents say are important. And so I had a phone call with a tiny house company called Tumbleweed Tiny Homes. I think they're still around. They were sort of famous up and coming at the time. And I learned that when you buy a tiny house, it's a little different from a financing perspective than a regular house. 
Banks are probably not going to give you a loan for a tiny house. They want a minimum square footage. They want a plot of land. Tiny houses to them are just glorified trailers and they want to loan you money for something that they can easily transfer and sell if you stop making payments and need to foreclose. So I learned through Tumbleweed, and they were great by the way, that they do their own kind of financing or they have a partner that will do financing. The challenge with this is that now I can't do the typical mortgage thing. In the United States, there is something called FHA, first time homeowner, I don't know what the A is, FHA. And it allows you to put as little as 3%, 5% down on a home. So you buy a house for hundred grand, this would let you put down like $5,000 and then make the other $95,000 paid over 30 years at whatever interest rate. Unfortunately, when you finance through a private lender, not through a bank, you can't put down 5%, you put down 20, 25% or more, and your interest rate isn't gonna be 4%, it's gonna be six, eight, 10, 12, whatever. So I put all this together, all these factoids, and realized, you know, I'm making like a little bit of money every month, maybe $2,000, $2, maybe $1,800 per month, gross revenue from my freelancing, so that's before taxes. Maybe I can make this happen in like a year if I save up, or maybe I have to save longer, or I have to get a girlfriend who can save up with me and we can put a down payment down and I can get a tiny house. But after a month or two of this, it didn't seem as viable anymore um, that I would ever have some savings like that. So I, I don't wanna say downgraded, but I iterated my idea from buying a brand new top of the line tiny house from Tumbleweed who again, they do good work, right? These are nice appliances, good build, but it's small. I thought maybe I can hack it because I've always had this mentality even before I could hack, had the mentality. And with that attitude, I said, wait a second, what else is about a hundred square feet and is pre-made and can sit on a piece of land? A storage shed. And nowadays, if you go online, you can find plenty of people trying to convert storage sheds into livable spaces or into home offices. And I think that's super cool. But back then, this wasn't a, a movement. This was just me saying uh, it's an alternative to a tiny house. And storage sheds, the whole thing is like six grand. Then you can get it customized and delivered and put together. Storage shed, you can't get a loan, but maybe I could get a loan from somewhere else and I would pay like $300 a month for my own house. It would be a storage shed and I would have to put in insulation and do more things to it to modify. But that was the plan. That was the plan. Uh, fortunately, and I'll explain why, fortunately, a couple months later, I got my first job out of school and I moved to New York City to do that job. And I never looked back. I never looked back. Uh, I've thought about tiny homes. I've thought about storage shed conversions, but I've only thought about tiny homes to the extent of investment properties that would look cool on Airbnb that elitist city people would go to and think it's cool to pay $500 a night. That's the extent of my thoughts on tiny homes over the last 10 years. And, you know, in other words, if you, if you set your sights on something small, which for me was an 80 square foot tiny home, and you put it on a pedestal that maybe one day you can do that. What sucks is that you may not even be able to do that. <laughs> um, or put more simply, for me, getting into tiny homes was a cope for being poor. I still appreciate minimalism, which is the idea that stuff is not going to fulfill you. It's also the idea that instead of having a lot of mediocre items, t-shirts you don't really like, watches you don't really like, shoes you don't really like, have a few really nice items that you love. So I'm still into that. But somewhere along the lines, for many people who get into minimalism, they also go down the rabbit hole of the tiny home movement. And I think that's a challenge. Now I've lived in many small apartments. In New York City and San Francisco, I had 300, 400 square foot apartments. And I was doing great, I didn't need more space. So this is not a PSA to buy a big house. But I will say, we need to know what we're capable of. And at some point, you don't have any motivation to realize your potential 
unless you can visualize your potential being realized. If that sounds circular, we don't have any motivation to work hard, earn, if we're doing nothing with the earnings, if we're not realizing it. So in other words, if you make a million bucks and you don't do anything with it, the million dollars doesn't exist. Money has no intrinsic value. The value of anything that you earn, whether it's a physical dollar or uh, a chunk of meat, depending on your economy, the value of it is realized at the moment it is used to consume something else, the moment it is traded for something else. There's no intrinsic value to capital, right? So you can go down the rabbit hole of working hard, making money, and living in a tiny home and having no bills. You can do that. But I want you to realize that every dollar you earn, since you can't take it with you when you die, is you trading your life, your sweat, your hours, your months, your years, for nothing. It's a superfluous use of your time. So now I'm just saying this to let you know I have abandoned the tiny house movement uh, because I want to abandon all trendy governors, like you have in a vehicle, governors that limit our potential. Minimum, minimalism is still cool though. I'll see you next time.